Hello and welcome to Conversations with Elizabeth Johnston. I'm your host, Elizabeth, and I am so honored to have an amazing guest with us today. His name is John Cooper. John Cooper is the lead vocalist, bassist, and songwriter producer for Skillet, one of the best-selling rock bands of the 21st century. This two-time Grammy Award-nominated 12-time platinum band sold over 12 million albums worldwide and they have taken home a billboard music award now between selling out arenas on four continents john has found time to launch his own podcast called cooper stuff podcast john it is such an honor to have you with us today thank you for coming on the show it's awesome to be here talking thank you so much for the invitation i love it john um i i have grown up uh, listening to you the last 20 years, honestly, because I heard you in the background as my kids um, love listening to you. Uh, Rock is not my thing. I love worship music, but uh, rock is not my vibe and my style. And so I kind of roll my eyes and tell my kids to turn on my favorite music. Uh, But, but my children have loved Skillet for um, honestly, as long as, I mean, I can remember for 20 years now, I've got 10 children and, uh, they've seen you at winter jam. In fact, my son was just at winter jam last week, I believe. And he came home, he said, Oh mom, he said, John Cooper just went so hard for souls. And he preaches such a bold message and a bold gospel. And he's so unafraid. And, um, this was my 19 year old son when he came home. And, and so my kids are super geeked out that I'm having you on my podcast. <laughs> and, um, you know, I want, I want you to know that I heard you a few years ago at a particular concert that was acoustic. So it was like, you know, toned down and more, more my, uh, um, my speed. And you shared, um, the story of your childhood, John, and how you weren't allowed to listen to the kind of music that you play now in your Christian home (laughs) and just your heart for reaching souls and reaching kids that aren't necessarily listening to my favorite style of music. And your testimony just deeply impacted me. I really thought, wow, you know, Skillet, they are not they're not out there for money. They are they're going hard for souls. And I just wondered if you would share with our audience that journey that you went on as a child. Well, that's so cool that your son was at the show. I love it. We we definitely have been having a good time and it's so <laughs> wonderful to just to be back on the road, you know, uh, like getting to play music and you see people these fans, they are so happy. I mean, you can oh. see it on their face. They're just like, they have these giant smiles. They're, it's just music helps people. Being in community, as we all know, helps people. And all of a sudden, you get all these different kinds of people together on the Winter Jam Tour. There's like, I think, seven different Christian artists, I believe. And, and, it's, and it's so eclectic. I mean, there's gospel music, worship, rap, weird hard rock, obviously, pop. It's everything, and it's such a yeah. sense of God is doing something really special right now. And so I just wanted to tell you that because I know, I don't know you very well, but I know that you'll get excited about the fact that I've been a Winter Jam probably six, five or six times over the last 15 years. I have never seen since this sort of gospel revival time. I mean, people are so oh. desperate for answers because the world is is just gone nuts. And so people are looking for answers and we are seeing incredible amounts of people get saved. So we are very excited. My sort of journey, if you will, began. um, My mom is really the biggest uh, force in my life. And that's why I'm always so passionate. Almost every interview or in every show, I like to brag on my mom. My mom taught me the Bible. My mom taught me how to pray. My mom forced me to memorize Bible scriptures, which I'm really glad now. <laughs> and, um, my mom was just a powerhouse for Jesus, wow. full of the spirit, full of the word, did not mess around. And so uh, I always say that to hopefully encourage moms and dads that are listening to, to, to do what my mom did. I mean, I'm telling you, that's, that's our job. I'm a parent, too. I don't have 10 kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I have two. Anyway, um, so that that was my journey. Now, in saying that, I also do laugh about the fact that my mom, in her love and zeal for Christ, 
mm-hmm. had had moments of legalism, you know, moments of things that I think she would be like, stay away from rock music, she, she stay away from wearing black, you know, <laughs> stay stay away from this and this and and uh, my mom genuinely believed those things were satanic or they would take me away from loving God. And I don't, uh, I don't mind it. Every parent, we all make mistakes. I mean, we're all doing, if anybody out there listening is like me, you've probably done some dumb stuff as a parent. All right. So, but my mom loved Christ. And so I grew up with a love for music. My mom also is a piano teacher um, and a voice teacher. How fascinating. There's where your musical gift came. Absolutely. My mom taught me about not just how to play music, but my mom taught me why to play music. Why do we play music? Well, where does this gift come from? And everything was in a in a uh, system to where we understand th- that, that music is created by God for his own pleasure. And he gives us an ability to create because we're created in God's image. He gives us an ability to create. And so therefore, what we create as his creation should bring bl- glory to God. Our gifts bring glory to God. And that's why even when you sometimes see a human being who is not a Christian, maybe they're a dancer or a, a singer or a piano player, or you go to a Cirque, a Cirque du Soleil and somebody's doing something that to us looks like superhuman, they may not be Christian, but what they are doing is an expression of a glorious God who created humans to do amazing things so that his name would be glorified. My mom taught me all of those things, and I've always held on to that as I've tried to create music to glorify God and and hopefully bring others to the knowledge of Christ through the music. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, Is your mom still alive, John? No, my mom died when I was 15. Um, My mom got cancer when I was in sixth grade, so I think I was about 12. And um, my mom was... uh, absolutely fierce. All right. And so she Mm. fought cancer for about three years. Uh, She had surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Um, She was in remission. Then it Mm. came back again a year later and she just kept fighting and fighting. And and she always said, John, I wrote about this in my book, actually, um, in case anybody's curious, I wrote only a little bit about the story, but my mom would tell me, John, I believe I'm going to be healed. But if I do die, you cannot be mad at God because Mm. God is always good. And everything that God does, he, 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 Romans 8, 28, we know that everything works together for the good of those who love Christ according to his purpose. You cannot get mad at God. And um, my mom was definitely very faith person though as well. So the two weeks before my mom died, I never got to say bye to her. She wouldn't let me come to Uh, to the hospital because she said, if you see me like this, you're going to lose faith. And I know God's going to heal me. So you can't come to the hospital. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the end, my mom did die. I didn't get to say bye. And there was some confusion there, but I held on to that wisdom that God is good. And that's a, there's a much longer story of that, which I won't tell right now, but I, I did have to learn to find God on my own at 15 and 16. Where is God during the valleys? Where is God during the heartache? Where is God when I feel like I've been praying? I know he's real, but I don't think he's listening. And I can, you can have those conversations with God. And through that, I began to know Jesus, not just as my Lord, but I began to know Jesus as my friend, that God was a father that accepted me and gave me joy. And uh, that's a whole long story, but I love to, I love to brag on God and his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. I could do that all day long. So through the death of your mother, yes, you asked hard questions, sincere questions about your faith. And and yes, it might have rocked you um, in a sense, but ultimately you're saying you you pressed into deeper intimacy with the Lord. Absolutely. I mean, the the, the real story, to put some flesh and bones on it, is, you know, I was was uh, 15 or 16. My mom had died. My dad remarried. Um, two months after my mom died. So we, we went from one situation to a much worse situation, to be honest. Whoa. Me and, yeah, me and my dad started fighting. Yeah. Um, I sort of hated my dad, just to be honest. Um, I think my dad probably hated me as well. Um, mm-hmm. And 
we would just go at it. And I just was like, I, all that I want to do is get out of this house. That's the main goal of my life. Right. And, um, I was in my bed around midnight and then that's when I would talk to God because I wouldn't be able to sleep. I would be so angry that I would feel like I was like on fire in a bad way. I was so mad and yeah. so angry at my dad. I wasn't even angry at God. I was angry at my dad. And sometimes I would pray. This is really dark. I hope you don't mind if I go to a dark oh, place. Oh, I'm loving this actually. Okay. Uh, this is <laughs> really, really good. There are a lot of people that are struggling with this kind of deep hurt and pain and anger. And I'm really glad you're sharing this because I've never heard this part of your story. So mm -hmm. carry on. <laughs> All right, good. I'm glad I'm glad to know that we're, we're within bounds. So yeah. I, I was praying, God, would you give me a chance to physically hurt my dad? Because he has never attacked me. I wish he would. I, I'm certain I could take him. And even if I can't take him, I want him to suffer in the way that he is making me suffer. Mm. And I used to fantasize about ways that maybe I could hurt my father. And um, I remember praying one night. This went on for a couple of months. And one night I just got really upset. And I said, God, I know that you're my savior, but I don't feel like you're listening to me. And I, I need I need something. Would it be okay, Jesus, if I could know you like a friend? And I heard this voice in my head. You could say God spoke to me, led whatever you want to call it with your particular theology. Mm -hmm. I had a voice in my head that just came to me and it said, yes, you can know me like a friend, but also like a daddy. And oh. I cried. I, I had never cried like that not at my mom's funeral, not at my mom's death. Because you see, at the moment, I had an earthly father who told me on a daily basis he was ashamed of me. He did not want people to know I was his son. Mm -hmm. And I was a failure. And I was never going to amount to anything. I was never going to be able to make a woman happy. Yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden, I found out that in God, through the death of Jesus Christ, that I actually mattered to God, that he's going to call me a son and that he would not be ashamed to call me his own. And I knew that it was true because I, I had read that in the Bible. And so I guess what I would say to people is this, it's okay to have these hard questions and it's okay to qu even just say, God, I'm questioning you. But you question God based on his word. His yes. word says something and his word is authoritative. His word is true. He will not break his promise or else he's not a faithful God, right? So that, 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 that so you question God based on his word. Well, God, you said that Jesus, that you're a friend of sinners. Mm -hmm. You said that you are a father to the fatherless. And I feel like I am fatherless right now. And all of a sudden the word of God came to me. And I will tell you guys, I, I did not ever think I could be happy again. Wow. But the Holy Spirit did something so powerful in my life that I just stopped being so mad at my dad. It just didn't matter anymore. And through uh, uh, years, I will admit it's years. This wasn't overnight. Yeah. After years had passed, all of a sudden, I was like, yeah, I know my dad did that to me, but I did a lot of bad stuff to him too. I was not a good son. I used to pray that I could hurt my own father. I was a bad son. I don't deserve Christ's forgiveness. I treated my dad. I don't deserve my dad's forgiveness. None of us deserve any of it. And so if Christ is going to give me what I do not deserve, then I have to give my dad what he does not deserve. And all of a sudden, I just didn't care anymore because the Bible says that righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit is the kingdom of God. That is the, king, that is the air that we breathe. We are living in the kingdom now, in part, right? We are living in the kingdom of God now, and, and forgiveness and joy and righteousness that's the air we breathe. So I would say to people, if you're struggling, that's okay. Struggle and challenge God, but challenge God based on his word being true. Yeah. It sounds like as you fixed your gaze and your focus more on Christ and what the Holy Spirit wanted to do in your life, that's where your breakthrough came. Oh, absolutely. That, and that's where it's going to come for anybody that's listening. It's not saying it's going to be easy. But what I think is happening right now in Christianity is a real move 
to, to, to question God, to doubt God, to think, I just don't know if that is real, but to do it not based on the Bible. So, yeah. so if you just say, well, I'm just going to challenge God. I just don't think what, well, that is just that what you're saying is, is that you feel that your own mind or your emotions are more authoritative than God. Now, that's a dangerous place to be in, because right. once you start to think you're more authoritative than God, then you become like Pharaoh in the Old Testament and your heart gets a little bit harder. Then it gets a little bit harder. I mean, you're talking about Pharaoh. You're talking about, you're talking about God has turned the, the water to blood. God sent down locusts. God's killing firstborns up in here. And Pharaoh still <laughs> thinks he's more authoritative than Yahweh. I mean, how does that happen? Delusional. Can, <laughs> it's, it's delusional. And that can happen in our lives. Right. If we challenge God, um, if, if we become a rival to him, you do mm. not want to become a rival to God. But if you say, God, I'm trusting in your word, will you, will you show your faithfulness based on who you are? Woo, that's Holy Spirit power mm. right there. That's good, John. That's so good. Um, so I'm sure that you probably get some criticism uh, for singing at secular concerts. Um, sometimes you're, you know, touring with Christian groups, and sometimes you're touring uh, and and going to events where secular artists are um, singing. And um, I'm just curious what your journey was to make that decision. Um, I think that that would be really interesting for our listener to understand. Yeah. Um... I think for me, I've always believed this is my understanding. And um, and before the show, you and I were, were talking about uh, there are a lot of people that watch the show who feel that they do want to get involved in various forms of uh, sometimes you might call it political realm or ethic, the ethical realm, what, let's say abortion or something like yeah. that. They feel that we should have a say in the culture. I would I believe that we should have a say in the culture. I, I believe that this is my personal theology that God wants his people to have a prophetic witness to the culture of what yes. is right and what is wrong and what is majestic, right? And we're, we are supposed to bless God as a prophetic witness to the culture. Part of that to me is the arts. And, yeah. and, and if you think about it like this, if you, if you read any sort of social scientists, you know, and sociology, when people talk about cultures in the past, you know, what was what was the, uh, the uh, Roman Empire like or what was this culture like? They're going to look at pillars. They're going to look at government. They're going to look at religion. They're going to look at art. That's yeah. why so much. Right. That's why so much of what we know about cultures is, well, this is the art that they made because art shows you what people value at the time. And it also shows you how people change the culture through art. And we saw that which is actually my mom, my parents saw that, which is why my mom didn't want me playing rock music. <laughs> we saw art being used to propel the sexual revolution of the 60s right. and 70s. So art can shape a culture. Well, why can't art that glorifies God and shouts the lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ over all of the earth and all of mankind, then why can't that shape the culture? And I believe that that's what music should do. Uh, whether, I don't care what style of music it is. A style of music does not belong to the devil because the devil doesn't create. The devil distorts. You know, he takes something beautiful and he, he distorts it until it's a false image of the wonderful thing that it was, right? That's all the way back back to, to the garden. And so my, my passion for music is to be a voice to the culture through art to proclaim the greatness of Christ in every sphere of life and hopefully, hopefully to win some to the gospel. Somebody may listen and I like that song skill it plays and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and listen to the words or come to a show and all of a sudden they might go, oh, the reason I like this so much is because of the message of Christ. I, I don't know. What, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I'm on tour and I'm, every night I meet about 30 people before the show. Okay. VIP tickets. Somebody comes to the line. He was about 50 years old. And he said, 10 years ago, he said, I was a meth addict. I didn't, I was not a Christian. I wanted to kill myself. I couldn't mm. quit. I couldn't quit doing meth. He said, I was listening to a rock station, a secular rock station. And he said, one of your songs came on called, um, not gonna die. 
<clears throat> and Skillet Song, Not Gonna Die, is not really a religious song. It's just about not giving up and, and not committing suicide or not giving up on your life or whatever. And he said, I'd never heard of Skillet. He said, it was that song that talked me in to checking into rehab. Mm -hmm. He checked into rehab, gave his life to Jesus. He's been clean for 10 years. And now he works as a counselor at that rehab facility, <laughs> leading people to Christ as a prerequisite of ending addiction, because it's the power of Christ that sets you free from the power uh, of sin and death, right? So, wow. he, so as a prerequisite, it, you give your life to Christ and now the power of God is in your life to break strongholds and to free you from that, uh, those addictions and whatnot, all because they heard a song on a radio. I almost couldn't believe it, but that's <laughs> what God does, man. That's beautiful. And, and I think that a lot of times in the body of Christ, we just want to focus on um, speaking to people who agree with us and we get stuck in an echo chamber. And I think um, even though, you know, I have no respect for the secular rock world and the the um, values that they are pushing on on young children, the fact that you know, you guys are there kind of like a tent peg at some of these concerts, you know, um, uh, raising the standard and, and, um, speaking truth and ministering the gospel, or they are uh, getting, following you and maybe hearing you at other concerts and hearing your Christian music. Uh, the fact that you're willing to be a bold witness in the, in the midst of that, I think, uh, you're much more likely to win souls than if you're just constantly surrounding yourself by people who agree with you. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, and I'm actually a big fan of what you just said, too. I mean, I love hanging out, uh, talking, having relationships with people that, that don't agree. And when we go and we play secular shows with metal bands, some of them may be on varying degrees of I don't know, atheism, agnostic, right. or they might be universalist. They might be kind of like a lot of them like my spirituality, even though they don't, they don't believe what I believe. They're kind of like, I kind of like it. It makes them feel good. It's, it's yeah. mystical. It's <laughs> right. mystical to them. And we get along great. And I think that that's a really powerful testimony because the truth is, is that you don't have to be, uh, you don't even have to proselytize at those events all that you need to do is honestly live the Christian life. The Christian life looks so very different. I bet you guys stick out like a sore thumb in so yeah. many ways. <laughs> you, I mean, well, and a lot of times we do. You're just being light in a dark place. Yeah. And um, sometimes people say, does it make you nervous? I say, no, it doesn't make me nervous because he who is in me is greater than he who is, is in the world. They should be nervous at the power of Christ coming yeah. down to, to their venue that uh, no i'm not nervous at all that's <laughs> Just, awesome don't make me start preaching now yes here, come on now it. come on <laughs> <laughs> look it's always fun to get to know people that you admire behind the scenes um you know we know your face and your image on stage as the lead singer for skillet but would you let us just kind of peer in for a minute into your road life uh, as a rock star? You know, what's what's would you say is the best part of road life, your favorite part of road life and your least favorite part of road life? <laughs> well, let's see. I mean, road life is is difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I obviously love it. It's 25 years we've been doing it now, so I better love it, you know. Um, and, and in reality, I mean, God made us for this because Almost every woman that I meet tells my tells my wife, I would never, ever go on the road full time in a bus with my husband and his kids wow. and their and our kids it, because it's just not glamorous. I mean, you're in a bus. We used to be in a bus literally with 12 other people. OK, and oh. you, you never have alone time. So it's like you're together. You're together 24 seven which means that you can argue a whole lot, but you're never like alone. You know, you never have any mm -hmm. decent time together. And, and also you're exhausted. So yeah. everybody knows when, especially when you have little kids, you're, you're so tired that you might just start blowing up on people. You don't even know that you're being mean. You're just blowing up on somebody. That's the really hard part, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the best part is because my wife and I both love playing music. But, but mostly we both just feel, we both believe in it. We both have vision for 
you know, why God called us to this. And, and I will say this, that we both, we both had that vision before we even met each other. So she had her own band and her own vision. I had my own band and my, but we, we, we definitely agreed that we wanted to do evangelism through music. So the passion for the gospel, that's the best part. When I get to meet that guy that comes through that says, He's listening to some rock and roll channel and some band song comes on and it changed his life. God used it to change his life. I'm on cloud nine for the rest of the night. That's like the, that's like the best thing you could ever hear. Right. And so that's the best part. And we were so blessed. We got to raise our kids on the road. I didn't have to leave my kids at home and, and, and go do my job and be gone for weeks at a time. We, we got to raise our kids on the road. And so did you, did you homeschool your children? I did not. You On the road? Not, you do you do not want me homeschooling anybody, I will tell you that. But oh, yeah, my oh. but yeah, my wife uh, my wife can do anything in the whole world. And so my <laughs> wife started she started homeschooling and then it kind of got too too much. And so we had we always had nannies because we had to have a nanny to watch the kids while we were playing. So then right. we we gave the job to the nannies until the kids were old enough. But like for instance, my son is 16 now and my son just turned in his his report. He had to write a scientific paper. And so he says, here's what I wrote, Dad, and my son, this is going to blow people away. My son <laughs> wrote a scientific paper on how pornography changes your brain patterns and it is, is used like, like drug addiction to change your brain patterns to make you addicted to. So that is a it's scientific fact now. Come on. My, my son is... <laughs> writing a paper for his uh for his school turning it in and of course you know this ends with basically well we already knew this if you believe in the word of god because that's what sin does sin locks you up and the more you give in to the sin the deeper you go down into the spiral so because of this time we've been able to have with my kids my kids just grew up my wow. my son my son could have a theological debate with any adult really about Calvinism versus Arminianism or any sort of theological issue, he probably could have a debate about it because he's grown up in this sort of worldview of Christianity and understanding, always being ready with a defense for the gospel. And so that's the, all that entails the best part of our job. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. Um, well, he's watched his dad be willing to be a Daniel too, you know, and his mom, um, <laughs> sure. you guys, you guys have, have modeled, uh, this for them. Um, it doesn't look exactly like it looks in other families. Obviously your family is, is definitely not the cookie cutter family far from it. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Your wife, she is incredible. She um, is. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, just, uh, his, his wife, uh, is in the band and she's very gifted, um, is she, she plays electric. Is that right? Yep. She plays guitar and keyboards. Yeah. She also produces our music and just, yeah, she's, nuts. she's absolutely awesome. Yeah. Nuts, talented, um, you know, um, amazing performer. And the fact that they're able to do all this as a family is just really incredible and, and unusual. Um, but they have seen their dad, you know, take bold stands, even on, on issues in, in the culture. And th we are in great need of more Daniels in our nation, in, in modern day America. Um, and in the prologue of your book, you tell a story of what I would call a real Daniel moment in your life. If you could just briefly share that with the audience, um, the story about the industry professional that really made you some tempting promises where you had to make a, a strong choice in that moment. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. I mean, and speaking of my wife, um, my wife is so hardcore, you guys, people don't even know. <laughs> my wife doesn't mess around and she, she's extremely, extremely convicted. The most convicted the person of conviction I've ever known. And that has rubbed off on me. Um, now, my wife is also an introvert, which is really funny because when you see her on stage, she's going crazy. And nobody would think that. But she, my wife, um, she's introverted. She's extremely intellectual. She's much more intellectual than I am. And she's extremely bold. And so we've always been together uh, uh, on this stuff even though she's always understood a lot more than me and she kind of helps me do it. I like to talk. So it works. She teaches me. I talk. No, I'm kidding. All right. So 
Um, but, you know, in, in the story that you're referring to, basically, it took Skillet about 13 years of no one really knowing who we were. I'd say 10 years until we started really getting known. And we began selling some records and, and we, were, we had gotten signed to a mainstream label. And we had just released uh, uh, an album with a song that was beginning to do well. We were out on tour. We were the opening band. There was three bands after us, secular bands. They were all really big, much mm -hmm. bigger than us. And they had, had an after show party at a bowling alley. And they said, John, you, you guys want to go? My wife was exhausted because she's always getting up with our kids at 6 a.m. Uh, and I was like, I don't want to go. I'm really tired, but I don't want to be like, the Christian band that never goes and hangs out with people at the bowling alley. And I was like, all right, I'll go. So it was a big show. So I went to the bowling alley, you know, I thought we'll roll a little bit and then I'll go. And there's all these famous people there. There were some famous um, professional athletes. There was a lot of people from the industry. And so what was shocking about it is that somebody said, Hey, John, and I didn't know he knew who I was. And he was a pretty fairly powerful guy. And he just pulled me aside and said, John, I want to be honest with you. He said, I'm going to tell you the truth because no one else is going to tell you. I think you could be the next biggest rock band in the world, but you have to strike. You have to strike when the iron, the iron is hot or something mm -hmm. like that. And I said, oh, cool. You know, I, I was flattered. And he goes, do you know what I'm saying? And I said, uh, yeah, I think I know what you mean. And he could tell that I really did not know what he meant. Mm -hmm. And so he said, John, nobody's going to be honest with you. So let me just give it to you straight, which I appreciate. I like straight talk. I said, give it to me. And he says, you could be the next biggest rock band in the world, but you have to stop talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. you got to stop talking uh, to Christian radio stations, playing Christian concerts, Christian festivals. Um, don't talk about what your songs made. You need to disassociate from that. Uh, because people don't take it seriously. And so he kept kind of going on and he wasn't being rude. That's the thing. He was trying to help me, you know, which I appreciated. And he was like, look, hey, but this is what he said that caught my attention. And this is why it's so important. He said, John, I'm not telling you to deny Christ. I'm not telling you to not be a Christian. Just tame it down. Don't talk about it. And then imagine in the future what you could do for Jesus if you were rich and famous. Imagine what you could do then. And that is the part that I wrote, the reason I started my book with it, because there's a there's an ounce of truth in what he's saying, isn't there? I mean, so, so alluring. Yeah. You're like, oh, so I could could get rich. Then I could let it out of the bag. Guess what? I'm a Christian. Yeah. And, and and there was an ounce of truth to it. And I went back to the to the bus. I told my wife about it. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, she's just like. Absolutely not. That's ridiculous. Not the Lord. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, she she's the best. She she's also discernment. She's got a gift of discernment. My wife isn't messing around. And I was like, told her, I was like, I, I don't think that's the Lord either. I'm so glad you don't. She's like, wow. this, you know, she's like, no, this is what the devil does. And so I, you know what it did for me was it made me more aware that the enemy is trying. To, to the way he takes truth and he just twists it a little bit to where it sounds good. Just a little. <laughs> just a little bit. And that, and so we need to be paying attention mm -hmm. in our lives for what God, uh, excuse me, not God, for what the enemy or your flesh, whatever you want to call it, yeah. is trying to, to make, to twist it because they want, because the enemy and your flesh wants to rob you mm -hmm. from the treasures, the, 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 the treasures and the, great things that God has for your life. I think it's the best way to say it. My pastor always says it this way. The enemy wants to render you ineffective for the gospel. That's yeah. what the enemy wants to do. That's so good. It reminds me of uh, the story of my friends, the Benham brothers. I don't know if you ever met the twins, David and Jason Benham, who um, had a huge show that they were already in the process of filming for HGTV and um, like you, you know, they had massive promises from the network of just tremendous success and fame and fortune were coming their way. And they, um, they got hit up by one of the people at the network to basically tone down their Jesus message. And they had that one moment of temptation, they said, 
to, yeah, well, let's just ride this wave of fame and power, and then we'll flip it and we'll use it for the Lord. And they had this moment, and just like you, they actually went to a mentor with this situation that that they were confronted with. And just like your wife, that mentor said, don't you dare compromise and tone down your message, not even for more influence. And what what happened was they got canceled. They got canceled from the from the network that they were already filming for, but then then God gave them this opportunity. They ended up on this just you know whirlwind tour of secular media uh, filming these twins that got canceled, and it ended up being honestly a real opportunity for them. And they're on every network you could imagine, front and center on the you know seven o'clock news preaching Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, explaining why they won't compromise. And uh, it was a, it was a real pivotal moment in their lives. It sounds like, um, you know, that was what you were faced with as well, but you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of true. It, it seems like there's a, an ounce of validity to what's being said. You know, Satan can be super sneaky. He's not going to come to us with a pitchfork and a, and a tail and, <laughs> you know, devil ears. He's going to come <laughs> in a very seductive and alluring uh, manner and whatever that would be tempting to you. Um, I got to keep going here. I got so many things I want to talk to you about and I only have a, a few more moments. Um, how do you take a bold stand as someone who is well known um, with this constant threat, John, of cancel culture? How do you navigate that personally? I'll tell you, Elizabeth, this is uh, such a, a difficult question. And I, I, I don't, I just always want to be really clear that for me, I'm not, I try not to be judgmental towards someone else for what they do, because I, I think the moment is we're all asking ourselves, what do we do? I mean, it, it's so unprecedented in our lifetimes. We've just never seen it. For me and, and the place that I am at, and, and I will admit that in some ways it's a little bit easier for me than it is for other, say, Christian artists and people with Christian platforms. It's a little easier for me to be honest with you because I'm not just starting my career. You, do you know what I mean? In other yeah. words, I've already sold a, a lot of records. God's already given me so much. I mean, um, if all of a sudden my, my career ended tomorrow, I'm not going to be destitute. I'm still young enough. I can do something else as well. I don't have as much to lose in that sense. Now, on the other side, I guess the more you have, the more you have to lose. And what I mean, I have 12, uh, excuse me, 18 employees or who cares? But I don't view it like that. For me, I just feel that we are at a time. Again, I won't put this yoke on anybody else listening. So this isn't for moms out there <laughs> that are like, you have to do what I do. OK, for me, I believe this is what I felt God speaking to me. We're at a time in culture in America that it is all or nothing time. Mm. This, this isn't the time to go, well, if, if I if I hold on to this, maybe in, in, in time, then that'll go away and the ground will be a little bit softer to then say this. And it, I don't think that's the time we're in. I think we are at the, you know, for all of us that always prayed, God, I want to be a Daniel, as you said. Yeah. I want I want to be a Daniel. Or for everybody that said, I want to be a, a Corey Ten Boom. Uh, for people who don't know, Corey Ten Boom is, of course, she she wrote the book, The Hiding Place. Yeah. She was, they were hiding Jews in there upstairs when the Nazis were coming around looking. And Corey Ten Boom and her family got put in, in a Nazi uh, prison camps and whatnot. Her, in fact, her father and her sister died in those camps. For all of us who have said, I want to be a Corey Ten Boom. I want to be a Bonhoeffer, if you're somebody that knows who Bonhoeffer was. I want to be a Daniel. This is the time to be the Daniel. It's yes. not going to be in a year, in five years. This is the time. It's a scary moment. And if it costs me my career, then fine. If that's what God wants to bring himself glory, I'm, I'm fine to lose my career and his sovereignty and whatever for his glory. If that means it costs me all my Twitter following or my secular music deal, or now I don't get asked to come play at so-and-so, so-and-so. These days, you might just, you might lose as many people in the Christian music audience as you lose in the secular for standing up for the word of God. I said it, there is so much apostasy in the Christian music industry. It is rife. It's disgusting. But anyway, 
point is, is that you may lose your Christian, your Christian industry people as well. <laughs> this is the time to stand or you're going, you're going to miss it. You, you, you're yeah. going to miss it. It was your moment. God had called you to this moment for such a time as this, and you kept waiting. You kept waiting for the, you know, it's almost like you're in the race and the the little gun went off. It's time to go to the race. You're like, I didn't hear it. Did it go off? Yes, it went off, and you're going to get left behind. So yeah. that that is not on anybody else. That is my conviction, and that's how I deal with it. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to proclaim boldly because it is the truth that sets people free. And I'm not going to stop. And when people come and try to cancel me, I'm going to assume that's because it is the word of God has come. And, you know, when the word of God is spoken or read, the word of God, I don't want to get too into theology, but the Bible teaches that the word of God comes and it brings blessing or it brings judgment. I don't know what's happening in someone's life. I don't know what's happening in their heart. All that I know is that if it brings judgment and that person comes and hates me for it, that's because I was speaking the word of God. And so I got to do what I'm going to do. Forget the rest. Yeah, John. And, and I mean, you make a great point that we don't just now face antagonism from the world. If we're being bold as a lion, as the right, as the Bible says, the righteous are now we face antagonism from the church. Um, I have friends who have lost their book deals because they are just bold about issues in, in culture. You know, they're, they're standing for freedom and standing against tyranny in culture. And the last person they should be getting canceled by is uh, Christians. You know, that should be, we should always be advocating for, um, for freedom. And, um, but I'm watching that happen to, to friends of mine. And I mean, to me, you, to me, this is when God has the opportunity to shine and to part the Red Sea and to show up as the fourth man in the fire. This is when Whoa. he has his opportunity is when mm -hmm. you get faced with that crux moment and you say, I will not bow down to the gods of this culture. I will take a stand. It doesn't matter what others around me are doing. And so we rob God of opportunities to uh, shine brightly through us because we never take that stand in that moment. And that's when he blows us all away. And I don't want to miss those moments. And I know you don't want to miss those moments either. And that's why um, I, I respect you and wanted you to be on the program today. Hey, look, I think it's really cool that you are well-read. Uh, you don't expect a rock star to be so well-read, especially reading all the dead guys, uh, <laughs> as you might say. Um, and so uh, just real quick, I, I know you love theology, you love apologetics. Um, what would you speak to the reader, speak to the young listener uh, about why it is important to read important books? Oh, what a great, wonderful topic. Uh, I know I sound like I'm pandering to women here. I hope I don't, I, I am not pandering to women. I say this in all my interviews. Once again, uh, it's my wife that got, is the person that most got me into reading wow. old dead guys. My wife, um, um, she's got lots of tattoos, <laughs> which yeah. is random, but my wife, like on one arm, she has a, a, a quote from St. Augustine on the other arm. She's got a quote from Spurgeon. You know, my wife is just really, she's a, a brilliant person and she's into theology and stuff. And when we first met, I mean, I was also into that, but she was really into it, you know? <laughs> and so I began a love for reading this might be encouraging to people. I, I probably didn't love reading until about I was probably 33. Wow. Before I was 30, I probably read like eight books my whole life. Okay. I didn't like reading. Yeah. And God just did something crazy in my life. And I started loving reading. And I feel like I wasted so much time because you're building upon the wisdom mm -hmm. of people who walked with God, people who had a love for Jesus, just like my mom had a love for Jesus. And, I, and my life is built upon that wisdom that my mom handed down to me. And so that's why I would encourage people to read a lot of the questions that, you know, I keep hearing this with a lot of the Christians that have fallen away from the faith and that have gone apostate. They say, I got all these questions and I'm not allowed to ask. And I'm like, yes, you are allowed to ask. And there's about a billion books written on all of these topics. It's not like they're not out there. It's not like... <laughs> 
Augustine and John Calvin and John Wesley and all that. It's not like they didn't write about these things. They did, and they still do. So I would encourage people, look on that wisdom. My favorite book I ever read was uh, A.W. Tozer. I don't know if everybody knows who Tozer is. It's spelled T-O-Z-E-R. And you can get it anywhere, Amazon, wherever. A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Pursuit of God that ch uh, changed my life. Wow. Uh, absolutely changed my life. And um, he also has a fantastic book, Tozer, called The Attributes, no, Knowledge of the Holy. Hmm. And J.I. Packer, Knowing God, that was a life-changing book. Yes, and um, those would be the books that I would, it, I would that that I love. If somebody's looking for something a little deeper, and you don't mind reading a little bit more complex language, I mean anything from the Puritans. I mean, um, J.C. Ryle wrote a book called Holiness, and I mean, as you're reading the book, you just like. I need to get saved all over again, <laughs> you know, um, because the, the the Puritans had such a love for holy living. And and so I, I want to kind of end, well, I don't mean we're ending the interview, but I want to end this question just by saying this, because it's something I feel really passionate about. I love what you said a second ago about it's time for Jesus to show up as the fourth man in the fire camera, or how you said it, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, one of the things I feel passionate about is encouraging Christians to fall onto the authority of scripture mm. and maybe let's don't spend so much time. I'm not saying that it's not worth talking about other issues because it is, and I even enjoy it, but I have a real passion for people who disagree on things like soteriology, <laughs> which is, which is for anybody who doesn't know the word soteriology. It's just a big word that means means of salvation. That means people that believe in Calvinism, people that believe in Arminianism or charismatics and non-charismatics you know these people go to war all the time um I, I don't i don't want to go to war about those things because we all believe in the authority of scripture and i spend a lot of time reading people who believe on all four of those things i just mentioned you know i'm mm -hmm. i tend to be reformed in my theology but I also am charismatic and a lot of reformed people don't really dig that about me mm -hmm. and so i've got Michael Brown, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, who is a charismatic, almost Pentecostal, right. is a really great friend of mine. Yeah. And he, I love Michael Brown. And I just saw him two weeks ago uh -huh. and I love it. But then I have friends that don't even believe in the gifts of the spirit for today. <laughs> you got um, a lot of I, enemies. That's what it boils down to. <laughs> I, uh, maybe. But I'm like, hey, but we're all we're all in this moment of we have to stand on the authority. We have bigger enemies to fight. Authority yeah. of scripture. As you just said, the incredible move of what I would say, there is an aversion against holy living, not just in the world, but even in the church today. Mm. So it is worth standing up for these cultural issues. And this is one thing that, again, the Puritans, Michael Brown, my charismatic friends, <laughs> um, my reformed friends, my Arminian friends, Something that we all agree on is holy living. What does the Bible say I'm supposed to live in my life and in my thought life and in my actions towards one another? So I think there's a lot of battles that we can be fighting together if we weren't beating each other up on some of these other secondary and tertiary arguments. You know, 100 percent. If we're going to see revival, we better stop putting God into our little boxes with our little titles and names. Um, and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I love that you're raising up a standard of righteousness and holiness, um, even in the books that you're recommending. And um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows how to um, access what you're doing right now. So if you have any uh, books or uh, albums or tours that you want to tell the audience about or your website, uh, please take this opportunity for just a minute and let everybody know how they can connect with you. Sure. I would love to do that. So i um, got my book. I happen to be home today, which is unusual. This is what my book looks like in yes. case anybody wants to know. It's called Awake and Alive to Truth. Um, I am on the road, but I just happened to come home for two days so I could do my interview in my studio, which is nice. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, you can get my book on Amazon. You can get it on Audible. I, I read it myself 
That's good. not necessarily a good thing. That it, is good. People... It's always best to have the book in the author's voice. <laughs> yeah, and, unless you hate my voice, and then you should get the book. Okay. Oh, you got that yeah. great raspy rock voice. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I hope hope people like it. So you can get it on there, or you can go to my website, johnlcooper.com. My podcast, as you mentioned, is called Cooper Stuff. It comes out sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a week. And just so people know the kind of things that I, I enjoy talking about, I talk about culture issues. I talk about uh, philosophy a lot. If there's something that happens in culture, I'll say this thing happened. This is why I think it happened according to philosophies of postmodernism and relativism and neo-Marxism and so forth. And I do try my best to bring it back through a theological lens for the Bible. This is what I believe the Bible says about this. This is how I think we should respond, as you so eloquently said a second ago, like to tyranny and things like that. Um, why does that actually matter? Because the, the Bible has something to say about the political realm, because Jesus Christ is Lord of all of every realm. So he has something to say about it. We might not all agree, but I do my best at explaining that. We don't pull any punches on Cooper stuff <laughs> because it's, as you said, it's that time it's now or yeah. never, man, yeah. we have got a job to do. So that's why I was glad when you um, sent me a message on my Instagram page and I, I clicked on your thing and I was like, Oh, I thought you were someone else. I thought you were someone that I knew that I didn't follow yet, uh -huh. which is why I said, yeah, friend. And it's like, Oh, she's not my friend yet, but I like what she's saying. And I agree. This is the time let's rise up. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Everybody make sure that you are following uh, John Cooper, um, lead singer for Skillet on his social media platforms. Check out his website and get his book. I really think that you are going to love John's book, especially my followers. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, to the podcast. And John, thank you so much. It was such an honor to have you on again. Uh, I get the best mom award this week around my house. They're all geeked out. Um, their mom interviewed John Cooper. How can it be? <laughs> so this this is a tremendous <laughs> honor. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you're doing for the kingdom. Oh, that's so sweet. Likewise, I really enjoyed it. Thanks everybody for listening. God bless.